Hi, it's Dr. Russ. Welcome to this video that I'm calling Unlocking Shoulder Impingement. Uh, I have a previous video that was called Untangling Shoulder Pain. It's pretty detailed and it's kind of general stuff about the shoulder, its anatomy, how we approach it, things that go wrong with it. It's a good companion to this video. I'm going to be referring to some stuff in this video that's in that video. You don't have to watch that one first, but it might be helpful if you watch it at some point. At least I hope it will be helpful. That's why I made it. Um, oh, I am Dr. Russ. I'm a chiropractor. I practice in Portland, Oregon. Uh, welcome to my channel. If you don't know me, if you're a provider, I hope this video helps you understand subacromial impingement syndrome and helps you help your clients and grow your business and get known as a shoulder person. If you're not a provider, just a human with arms that you would like to move better, I welcome you too. And I hope you learned something from the video and maybe take some ideas to your practitioner, which I hope you have, or whoever's helping you with your impingement, and uh, try and make the world a less shoulder painful place, one shoulder at a time. What is shoulder impingement? It is pain in and around the shoulder resulting from crowding in the subacromial space. And that crowding impacts the important structures in that space, which are tendons, tendon sheaths, and bursa. Let's look at our anatomy together. Here we have our clavicle here. The SC joint is here. The AC joint is there. There's the head of our humerus. Here's the subacromial space right here. We get a nice view of it. If we take a close look at the shoulder from the anterior, there's our coracoid process, our coracoacromial ligament, and our acromion process. So a couple things to remember. First is that the coracoid is part of the scapula. It pokes out off the front of the scapula. So whatever happens to the coracoid happens to the whole scapula. The acromion is also part of the scapula. You can see it wrapping around like this from the spine of the scapula. And this ligament here, the coracoacromial ligament, is not a very soft, pliable ligament. It is tough, it is hard, uh, and it doesn't have a lot of give. So we call this coracoacromial arch. We have a nice picture of it here from the side. Here's a side view of a dissected shoulder. Here's the acromion, here's the ligament, here's the coracoid, and you can see it very much forms an arch. And what's in this space? Well, here's the long head of the biceps tendon that's been cut away. Very interestingly inserts on the top of the glenoid fossa after going through the shoulder capsule. There also will be the supraspinatus tendon and its sheath and the subacromial bursa. Here's a front view of that. Supraspinatus muscle here, tendon here, wrapping around on its sheath to the greater tubercle of the shoulder. This little gray pillow is the bursa, which sure looks nice and flat and flaccid in there, but imagine if that thing swelled up. There really is nowhere for it to go. If it swells, it's going to be under pressure very quickly, and it's going to hurt. And here's the long head of our biceps, its tendon, its sheath, as it pierces the glenohumeral joint, and comes here and attaches to the top of the glenoid fossa and the glenoid labrum. So those are the structures that are in there. That's kind of our basic anatomy. Before we talk about subacromial impingement, let's talk about some differentials and overlapping issues that we see a lot. Um, I don't love bullet lists, but sometimes they're useful, so there's going to be a few here, and here they go. Uh, your first differential slash overlap with impingement syndrome is traumatic injury. So a tear to a tendon, a tear to the glenohumeral capsule, a tear of the uh, glenoid labrum, a fracture to a bone. doesn't happen very often, but it does happen. Uh, the glenoid fossa or the humeral head or neck. Um, if any of those things are there, there'll be trauma in the history there'll be a lot more pain, there'll be swelling. Um, a big differential here is that with impingement, it usually really only hurts when they move it, especially in abduction internal rotation, like reaching for my back pocket or pouring out a beer can. Uh, with If there's pain at rest or pain with isometric contraction, there's probably something else going on as well. So let's say your supraspinatus is torn and the tendon is swollen. You have a supraspinatus tear but that swollen tendon is also creating impingement syndrome because it's pushing up against the uh, coracoacromial arch and creating impingement. You have to treat 
and deal with the injury first. Get the acute inflammation down, make sure the tissues are in a proper position to heal well, and then as it's rehabilitating and repairing, you can work on that symptom of subacromial impingement by restoring mobility, alignment, and circulation. Those are always the things that we have in mind. Um, so in later stages of uh, a rotator cuff tear, for example, or a torn shoulder, impingement syndrome will be a part of it. But in the early stages, it's more about that injury. Another way that we can have a lot of overlap and need to differentiate is DJD in the shoulder. There is a lot of DJD in the shoulder out there. Uh, and the things you'll see in that history, number one, the patient's older. Number two, there's crepitus. So not just like crunchies around the levator, which a lot of people have when they roll their shoulder, but crackling and crunching with glenohumeral movement, that kind of crepitus. Um, there'll probably be a history of pain, like they've had many episodes of pain in the area over their life, and uh, potentially trauma. They've had a, one or more traumatic injuries. Even if it's 30 years ago, that set up that process of degeneration. Because remember, degeneration is dysfunction over time. So you create a dysfunction when you're 25 uh, because you jumped over a wall and misjudged it and landed on your outstretched arm and fractured your distal clavicle. Well, you also probably <laughs> didn't do any good to your glenohumeral uh, cartilage or your labrum, and you started a process there of chronic dysfunction of which over time became degeneration. And so a simple x-ray will confirm DJD of the shoulder. Uh, and if x-ray is in your scope, don't be shy about taking x-rays. Sometimes you need to see. Um, there can be osteophytes on the glenoid. There could be osteophytes on the humeral head. And there could be osteophytes on the AC joint, all of those things. AC osteophytes in particular can be tricky uh, because they mostly, unfortunately, point inferiorly right into that subacromial space. So here's a nice open subacromial space here on this x-ray of a nice non-degenerative shoulder. Smooth glenohumeral joint right there. Beautifully smooth humeral head. Everything is like brand new. It's probably even smells like a new car. Here is a degenerative uh, glenohumeral joint. So let's kind of go back and forth between these two for a second here and here. So like, look this humeral head, it almost looks serrated. It's not going to be easy for that um, supraspinatus and long head of biceps tendons to traverse this course. Look how closed down the glenohumeral joint is here. That's really important uh, because when you abduct your arm, so let's say this is my humerus, this is my humeral head, and this is my glenoid fossa. When I abduct my arm, you see how the humeral head rolls and glides. So it's not just a roll that would kind of look like this. It's got to roll and glide. It's got to glide inferiorly, superior to inferior, as it rolls. And you can see in this degenerative shoulder, I don't think that's going to roll and glide real well. It might roll OK, but it's not going to glide. And so it's going to kind of roll like this. And here's our chromium right here. And bang, it's going to impinge those delicate, prone to inflammation and irritation structures. So your impingement syndrome may overlap or be a symptom of degenerative joint disease in the shoulder. It's good to know if that's what you're dealing with, always. So of course, there's trigger points always, everywhere. Everyone has them, not in every muscle, but we all have them, particularly our upper body, definitely our shoulders, especially if we work with our hands like we do as body workers. So um, you can learn to identify trigger points. It's important to do so with palpation. So a lot of these particularly Infraspinatus, teres minor, and latissimus trigger points will refer pain into the same area of a subacromial impingement, right over the deltoid. The main differential is with your palpation. So the patient's at rest. Let's say their pain is zero to minimal, and you go and palpate on that infraspinatus and that teres minor. This is where the trigger points tend to be. And you press on it because you feel the textural change of a trigger point and it reproduces, it lights up their pain. Well, they may still have some subacromial impingement, but that part of their pain at least is from the trigger point. And resolving and clearing out the trigger points will really help them, and they'll be happy, and so will you. Finally, uh, another major differential, and of course this is not the most exhaustive list in the world, is the frozen shoulder. Uh, this is like an impingement syndrome times 100. 
with the impingement syndrome, the patient will be like, yeah, it hurts if I do this. With a frozen shoulder, the patient will be like, I cannot move my shoulder at all without a huge spike of pain. And a big part of that presentation is their apprehension about you touching it and moving it because if you forced it, you could send them into spasms of pain that would probably echo throughout their body for hours, if not days. So be careful with your patients in general. Please don't force their bodies to do things that they don't want to do. With a frozen shoulder, it's pain at rest and severely restricted range of motion. And if you try to move it, you're going to find that end field to be really firm. It's really guarded. They're really apprehensive about movement, and rightly so. Unfortunately, um, there is no quick fix for a frozen shoulder. It takes months. Uh, and the best you can do as a body worker is to keep the rest of their body and to keep that shoulder as healthy as possible with pliability and circulation while it resolves. Um, there may be some things that help it resolve. Look into the research. It's not a specialty of mine. I don't really want to talk about it much more. Um, be aware of your patient's systemic metabolic state. Do they have connective tissue disorder? Are they hypermobile? Is there autoimmunity? Is there allergy? Is there a, rheum a rheumatoid condition? These things are all really important in understanding their preferences and contraindications, which we want to know about all of our patients before we start. Number one, are they in the right place? Is it safe and appropriate to apply manual therapy to them? And then sometimes there's infections or neoplasia that will take up space in there and look just like a supraspinatus tendonitis. And the way that you know those folks is, um, well, if it's an infection, there'll be probably signs of infection. But if you're treating them and they're not getting better, there's probably something else going on, right? It could be a habit. It could be posture. It could also be a local metabolic or neoplastic issue. So it is okay and indicated to get imaging on a patient who's not responding to care uh, because what we do works so well um, that when patients don't respond, it's probably because it's not what they need. Okay, so let's talk in general about our approach to this and then we'll get into some very specific knit and grit of specific muscles, how they affect the shoulder and how things go wrong. So our approach, number one, as I said before, make sure that they're in the right place, body work is safe and indicated for this person. Number two, which flows from that, is understand their contraindications and their preferences. And their preferences are very important. Uh, if someone comes in and says, I don't like deep work, I don't think, well, you just haven't had it done correctly yet. I think, oh, thank you for telling me. We will be gentle. We're going to work with induction. We're going to work with gentle fascial techniques because I trust you that you know your body. And if I feel like I want to go deeper, I will ask you. Can we go a little bit one layer further in here with my pressure? And if they say no, then no, I'm not going to force anyone to do this. Here's another bulleted list of um, contraindications and things you need to know about your patients uh, from the intake, from the history, from the exam. If you're not licensed to diagnose, I hope that you are in a relationship with someone who is um, so that you can get these questions answered. So once we know their contraindications and we know they're in the right place, then we observe, we palpate, we examine. We try to determine what tissues are affected and what processes are taking place. So understanding where the tissues are and how manual therapies affect these different processes, we can apply the appropriate manual therapies to the correct tissues, observe the results, and go from there. So here's kind of a chart of that. We're going to palpate and observe. We're going to mobilize restricted structures. We're going to release trigger points. We're going to recondition adhesive tissue. We're going to observe again, and we're going to go from there. Most shoulder issues are layered. Most musculoskeletal issues are layered, um, but shoulder issues in particular, because there's so much compensation going on in there. So having said all that, let's get specific about shoulder impingement syndrome. Impingement in the shoulder occurs when either the subacromial space gets smaller or the stuff inside the subacromial space enlarges, usually due to congestion and swelling. Sometimes both of those things are happening at the same time, and it can be really painful and inconvenient. The symptom is here. It's the deltoid, the upper arm, the upper scapula, sometimes referring kind of up that upper trap, and it's almost always going to be worse with movement, and it's almost always going to be worse with abduction and internal rotation. 
the more there's pain at rest and the more different movements are provocative of pain, the worse the issue is and the closer we're getting to a true frozen shoulder. But let's just say we have a moderate issue, not much pain at rest. It hurts when I go like this. It might hurt a lot when they go like this and still just be impingement. Most of the time, having ruled out all other stuff, the most common cause is the muscles of the shoulder are restricted, adhesed, and have trigger points in them. And that can happen post-trauma, that can happen from repetitive strain, that can happen from postural problems, misuse, a disuse. Basically, as mammals, we're just kind of prone to this stuff happening. Here's a cycle that I talked about in untangling shoulder pain. It's our unfortunate mammalian tissue cycle. Restriction of a region, a musculoskeletal region, will cause poor local circulation, which causes congestion. Congestion over time consolidates and becomes sticky adhesion, and that adhesion causes further restriction, which causes further congestion, which consolidates into further adhesion, which creates more congestion. So we want to try to intervene here. Our intervention for that restriction is to mobilize. For congestion, it's to improve and encourage robust local microcirculation. And for adhesion, recondition the tissue, work it, get it pliable, stretch it, help strengthen it. And that's how we want to intervene. So when it comes to the shoulder, in particular, the subacromial space, these are the four really important structures. Number one, the scapula as a whole. What's its position and how does it move? Is it tending to be protracted? Is it tending to be stuck and not really want to move very well on the rib cage? Very common problem. Number two, the coracoacromial arch, that roof of the subacromial space. Number three, the clavicle at both ends. Because that clavicle through the AC joint is totally connected to the acromion, it needs to be able to elevate in order for the subacromial space to stay patent. And then, of course, the position and the mobility of the humerus. Those are the four bones, the four structures in particular that we're looking at. So let's start by looking at the muscles that affect the subacromial space and the AC joint. And first and foremost are the pec, pec minor, coracobrachialis, and short head of the biceps. These are the three muscles that insert onto the coracoid process. They all insert from inferiorly and they all exert an inferior force on that coracoid process. So when they're restricted, tight, adhesed, they're gonna anchor that coracoid process down. And when you try to abduct your arm without moving your coracoid, you can see it doesn't go. That coracoid needs to be able to elevate as you abduct your arm or it won't move. And if you try to force it, you're gonna pinch the stuff that in the subacromial space between the head of the humerus and the underside of the coracoacromial arch. So number one, first and foremost, we have to see, does the coracoid process move with shoulder abduction? We want it to elevate as the shoulder abducts and depress as the shoulder comes back to neutral. If it doesn't, we need to work the pec minor, the coracobrachialis, and the biceps. Don't forget that that coracoid process is directly attached to the acromion through the coracoacromial ligament. So whatever happens to the coracoid happens to the whole scapula and of course to the acromion as well. In untangling shoulder pain, we talked about the subclavius muscle. Don't forget it's there. Lots of people forget it. Well, it depresses the distal clavicle when it contracts. So if it's in a state of hypertonia or if it's got a trigger point or is restricted or adhesed in some way, it's gonna create an inferior force on the acromion process and prevent it from elevating as you abduct your arm and create impingement. So just a word about hypertonia. Hypertonia is not a muscle problem. It's a neurological decision that the brain is making subconsciously in the cerebellum, in the midbrain, and in the reticular activating system. It's about vigilance. It's a lot about stress and social and emotional factors Yes, you can relieve it with touch. Yes, you can get a hypertonic muscle to relax with touch, but that's really because you're helping to regulate the person's nervous system with your calm presence and the healing environment that they're in. Um, so hypertonia is important, but it's not a muscle problem. It's a neurological thing. And maybe that's another video of like, 
How do you help a person regulate their nervous system when they come to see you? And how do you teach them to do it for themselves in between visits? Here is the sheath and the tendon of the long head of the biceps. As you can see, it pokes right into that glenohumeral capsule, goes right into the subacromial space. That tendon can just swell from overuse. That's going to create impingement because it's in the subacromial space. Trigger points and a lot of biceps trigger points in the world that a lot of people don't really look for when they're doing trigger point work uh, can create restriction in the glenohumeral joint, which can lead to or predispose someone to impingement. And then let's talk about the muscles that affect the clavicle. Don't forget that upper trapezius and the SCM have important clavicular attachments and restriction of those muscles will restrict clavicular movement, which will translate into subacromial impingement through the acromion process and the um, coracoacromial ligament. The levator is often thought of as a neck or scapular pain muscle, but it is super important that that levator has pliability and extensibility in order for the shoulder to abduct. Here we're looking at someone from behind. If that shoulder goes through abduction, that scapula is gonna rotate this way. We call it superior rotation of the scapula because the glenoid is going superior, but the superior angle of the scapula represented by my pointer finger has to depress. And what muscle is holding it there? Mostly the levator scapula. So if the levator is super tight and short and restricted, it's not going to allow for good scapular movement and it's gonna create subacromial impingement. Again, by the humerus banging up against the underside of the coracocranial arch because it just can't get out of the way. I don't have it on a diagram, but this reminds me another super duper important muscle for scapular mobility is the serratus anterior. So I recommend at this point, um, make sure that you know that I got lots of treatment videos on my channel, probably at least half of them I'm working on the shoulder and trying to show how to approach these muscles, how to work with them, so the patient is comfortable, whatever the patient's body size or male or female, and to do it in a way that's effective and safe and also feels good to the person. Let's look at the front of the shoulder and the big main mover of the muscle here, the pectoralis muscle and the deltoid. I call it the deltopectoral fan, and it's made up of three parts, the sternal division of the pec major, the clavicular division of the pec major, and then the deltoid itself. I call them pecsternal and pecclavicular for short. So if the arm is dependent and you're not leaning on something, contraction of these muscles will compress the glenohumeral joint. It's gonna pull that humerus up and in. And likewise, if the arm is fixed and you're leaning on it and these muscles contract, they're gonna be pulling inferiorly on the clavicle. So you can see how any or either or both of those things can create uh, crowding and um, make the subacromial space tighter, which we don't want it to do. We want it to be nice and open. In particular, that clavicular division of the pec major is going to exert a lot of influence on clavicular position. So anytime there is a subacromial impingement, long story short, we're going to work the pec minor, the coracobrachialis, short head of biceps. We're going to check long head of biceps for trigger points. We're going to check the trapezius, the SCM, of course, all of the sits muscles, and we're gonna come here under the clavicle, work the subclavius, and we're gonna work the pec major clavicular attachment as well, because we want all of those muscles to be mobile and pliable and have good circulation and can be as free of from trigger points as possible so that the shoulder has the best chance to function and the subacromial space has the best chance to stay patent uh, when prevent or resolve subacromial impingement. So again, treatment videos on my channel. And hey, by the way, if you like my channel and you're still on this video, 20 something minutes in, um, give me a like, subscribe, become a channel member. Uh, I really like doing what I'm doing. This is a lot of fun for me and I'd like to keep doing it. So any support you can provide, um, I'll be really grateful. So there's a few more things to look at. A big, big granddaddy muscle of the shoulder is the latissimus. So this big giant sheath of the lower back and the middle back twists itself through the axilla and inserts on a spot about this big on the proximal humerus. And as it goes through the axilla, it passes behind the coracobrachialis, the short head of the biceps, the long head of the biceps, and it can get adhesed there. So lots of people 
come up with impingement because of adhesion in the axilla. So working the lat, working the triceps, the teres minor and major, and of course the serratus and almost every shoulder video because almost every shoulder treatment I do involves some serratus anterior work. It's that important. Similarly, the subscapularis has to pass through the axilla and get by the biceps coracobrachialis complex, and there can be adhesion there as well. So knowing how to work and not being afraid to work in the axilla is actually a really good business decision because a lot of body workers don't know how or they don't want to or they think their patients don't want them to, but if your patient has shoulder pain and you got to get up in there, then do it. Learn how to do it gently. Um, learn how to do it properly. There are vascular and neurological structures in there that you need to know where they are. So like, don't go, you know, willy nilly, but um, it's important to be comfortable and get comfortable working in there. Let's look at the pec sternal. It's a great big muscle, but what if we flapped it back and looked underneath? It's passing over the pec minor. It's passing over the coracobrachialis and both heads of the biceps, and there could be adhesion there as well, which is going to restrict all shoulder movement, which is going to really uh, create congestion, which is going to create adhesion, which eventually will lead to subacromial impingement. Of course, our supraspinatus is really important in impingement syndrome. It's one of the main muscles that's going to be affected. So we want to make sure that it's free of trigger points and that it is not swollen or congested or adhesed. It is prone to congestion and edema. It's sort of a circulatory blind end. Um, and so being able to restore circulation and mobility into that muscle can go a long way in a lot of different shoulder problems. Uh, so particularly impingement. Here's another space where we see a lot of adhesion is around the long head of the triceps with the teres major, the teres minor, and the latissimus dorsi. So again, all up under here. So patient comes in with shoulder impingement. We've determined that that's what they've got based on their history and symptoms. We're going to observe their range of motion and palpate their structures as they move. And we're going to say, well, uh, I think the biggest restriction is right here of your coracoid. So let's start there and let's work some mobility back into your coracoid and stretch and lengthen that pec minor. And oh, look, here's an adhesion where the ribs are and we're gonna get more movement in there. And then maybe that's one visit. Maybe that's a visit. And then in between, you teach them how to mobilize and stretch and maintain whatever mobility you imparted so the circulation can move through and it can be more healthy. And then they come back and you feel it again and you're like, okay, now the main restriction is here in the latissimus. So we're gonna work the lat. The whole thing, from the humerus to the iliac crest, everywhere that it crosses another muscle, we're going to make sure that it's mobile. And maybe that's a visit, or maybe on that visit you also do serratus. And then in the next session, you're like, now it's the levator. And so you really worked their whole shoulder eventually. Depending on the person and depending on you, you might get all that done in one or two visits. It might take six or seven. We don't know. Uh, but usually people will start to feel better pretty quickly once you start to get mobility and circulation and start reconditioning those tissues. And finally, of course, rotator cuff trigger points, as I mentioned before, very important, almost always gonna be there with any shoulder problem, particularly impingement, because they develop in response to pain and guarding. Um, so those are important to address as well. Here again is kind of our approach flow chart, very, very shorthand. Um, but I'm trying really hard to distill my thought process and the way that I approach these things down into videos that are not six hours long. Uh, this one's clocking in about half an hour, and I appreciate you watching. Uh, I'm Dr. Russ from Portland, Oregon. I welcome your comments. Uh, I appreciate any support you might be able to provide our channel so we can keep doing what we're doing. Uh, I wish you a good day in practice today or tomorrow or both. And if you're not a practitioner, I wish you healthy shoulders. Thanks for watching. Uh, my contact link will always be in the video description. You can reach out anytime. Dr. Russ signing off.